Praveen Kumar, Coordinator of Geomatics Engineering, Professor J.K. Ghosh. All my faculty colleagues from the department and from the other department, research scholars, PhD students, faculty, uh, the uh, MTech students and BTech students, I welcome you all to this endowment lecture. Now I request all the dignitaries to please occupy the seat on the dais. I request the uh, chief guest director, Professor K.K. Pan. I request Dr. Tapan Mishra, our head of the department and the coordinator. Please occupy this. As per the tradition, we like to welcome the dignitaries to the bouquet of the I request Director Sir to please welcome Dr. Tapan Mishra with the bouquet of flower. Please. And Director Sir to please offer this all to our eminent speaker. I request head of the department, Professor Praveen Kumar, to please come on the address and speak something about Professor R.J. Garde Endowment Lecture Series. Director of IIT Rookie and Chief Guest of today's function, Professor K.K. Pan, our eminent speaker, Dr. Tapan Mishra, Dr. J.K. Ghosh, Professor P.K. Gar, uh, dear colleagues and the students. Today we are having the second lecture of the Professor R.J. Garde Endowment Series. First lecture was uh, delivered last year and the second lecture is being delivered this year after the corona. So it's my proud privilege to tell you about Professor R.J. Garde under whose uh, name this lecture is being organized. So he was definitely a very renowned person and uh, uh, I want to, to uh, read out about him. Professor R.J. Garde was born on April 19, 1929. Uh, he obtained his MS and PhD degrees from Colorado State University, CHU, Fort Collins, USA in 1956 and 1959, respectively, under the guidance of Professor Albertson. Three people who had a profound influence on him in his formative years were Dr. Apte, Professor Albertson and Professor E. W. Lane, his teacher at CSU. Professor Garde research contributions were recognized by Pune University, which conferred on him the DSC degree in 1985. After obtaining his PhD from CSU, Professor Garde joined the University of Roorkee as a lecturer in civil engineering in 1959. He rose to the rank of professor in 1966, a position from which he retired in 1989. During his tenure at Rudki, he held several important positions like Dean of Academic Programs and Head of Civil Engineering Department. He also worked as a visiting professor at the University of Mosul in Iraq from 1974 to 1976. Professor Gerde was the Pro-Vice-Chancellor of the Indira Gandhi Open University, IGNU, 
at New Delhi from 98, 1988 to 1991. Professor Garde worked as a UGC Emeritus Fellow and in charge senior scientist in the Center of Water and Power Research Station, Pune, for several years. Professor Garde was a member of the Advisory Council of the International Center for Research and Training in Erosion and Sedimentation at Beijing, China, from 1986 to 1992. He was also a member of Council of the International Association for Hydraulic Research from 1985 to 1989. Professor Garde was the founder president of the Indian Society for Hydraulics. Professor Garde taught undergraduate and postgraduate students with great enthusiasm with for over 50 years. Uh, Professor Garde always attempted to inculcate the young student the habit of self-study and impress upon the student community. The importance of staying abreast with the current developments in one's chosen area of specialization. As this is guide for masters and doctoral students, he wanted them to use these sojourns as a preparation and a launching pad for a long research career, the degree marking the beginning and not the end of a research activity. Despite his deep, deep commitment to teaching, one could probably say safely that he, his first love was research. He brought to bear upon his work at Roorkee the background he had acquired at CSU in the field of fluvial hydraulics. Undoubtedly, Dr. Garde's most significant scientific contribution have been in the area of fluvial hydraulics. His work covers virtually the entire spectrum of problems in the area. He has made several contributions in the sub-areas of sediment yield from catchment, bed forms, and channel resistance. Professor Garde is internationally recognized for his three books in fluvial hydraulics, namely Mechanics of Sediment Transportation, River Morphology, and History of Fluvial Hydraulics. The complete list of honors and awards conferred on him is rather long, and only a few have been cited here. He was a fellow of the Indian National Science Academy, INSA, and the Indian National Academy of Engineering. He was the president of the Indian Society of Hydraulics for three terms. Professor Garde was a pleasant, warm, and affable person who seldom lost his school. He was fond of music, Hindustani classical, and Western classical. So it's my proud privilege to tell about him here to the new generation. And uh, we are happy that we are organizing this course, this lecture in memory of him. Thank you. Now I request the coordinator, Geomatics Engineering Group, Professor J.K. Ghosh, to brief us about the relevance of today's lecture. Good evening, everybody. Respected Director Singh. My dear Dr. Tapan Mishra, Head Civil Engineering Department, Professor P. K. Gart, my dear colleagues and students. First of all, I would like to thank our director for his consent to act as a chief guest and Dr. Tapan Mishra for agreeing to give a lecture on SA, Synthetic Aperture Water. We know how the for modern day civil engineering geospatial technology provides the Similar data and information as a prolific ground for data analytics of civil engineering. Why are you talking about data analytics? Because this is the most prospective uh, career development nowadays that the students are looking forward. And synthetic aperture ladder is the latest technology for acquisition of geospatial data. And the strength of the uh, synthetic aperture weather lies in its capability to acquire data in all weather conditions, as well as it acquires data in the microwave range of the electromagnetic energy, that is the data which we will not be able to acquire by our natural sensors or uh, conventional instruments. We can get the data through SAR. Technology. So we will get a huge uh, amount of information beyond what we can perceive or what we can acquire through normal instrumentation. So we can make use of this for our different civil engineering projects in an innovative way. 
And uh, there are so many projects which is not possible to do at the present level of data acquisition can be done wisely by making use of SAR data. That is the inspiration why we are looking for this topic under this uh, <clears throat> lecture series. Already uh, there are so many uh, applications which uh, we can make, we are making use of SAR data like uh, space contamination or pollution, sea water pollution or ground deformation or if you want to go for um, breeze structure deformation or any change in its movement. So these are the critical areas which uh, is very difficult to study in the conventional methods that can be done quite comfortably using SAR data and many of them using some UOV platform. So actually, uh, <clears throat> we are eagerly looking for this topic because you know, without uh, proper understanding of SAR, it will not be possible to make use of the data in an innovative or judicious way. So we are looking forward to uh, this lecture. So, uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, before we start our lecture, ladies and gentlemen, it is desired that we take the blessing from our head of the family. It's my proud privilege and I feel honored to briefly introduce our chief guest, director of the Institute, Professor K.K. Pant. Professor Pant received his PhD in chemical engineering from IIT Kanpur in 1997. He took over as the director of Indian Institute of Technology on Rurki on October 12th. 2022, very recently. Professor Pan previously held the positions of Petrotech Chair and Federation of Indian Petroleum Industries, Chair Professor, Chairman Gate and Jam, Chairman Library, Head of the Department of Chemical Engineering, and Dean Faculty at the Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. He is adjunct faculty at the University of Saskatchewan in Canada. He is also a fellow of several national and international academics bodies, which includes the National Academy of Science India and the Indian National Academy of Engineering. So I request the director, sir, Professor Pan, to bless us with these words. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gar, for introducing me in an collaborative way. And I am not the chief guest for this session. I am just uh, right, the host. And first of all, the distinguished speaker for today, Dr. Uh, Tapal uh, Mishra, head of the department, Professor Praveen. The coordinator of the event, Professor Jayant Khos, and distinguished faculty members who are sitting on the dais, and student research scholars and undergrads. It's a very good evening to all of you, and uh, I feel pleasure to be here, right uh, in the Department of Civil Engineering, where this kind of right, uh, uh, what what you see, a kind of very important talk, whatever to talk right, the uh, SAR technology which are the new area for research, although as you, you will hear right, Dr. Santos, it's not a new technology, but when you look at the kind of image, right, and the area when you look at the applications, right, you are looking at in terms of the right, geological science now, but uh, Dr. Mishra has done a lot of work at right, with the show, as an advisor to the chairman of the show, and he did a right, lot of right, uh, the work in terms of modeling simulation, when you look at the right the sensitivity of the data or image sensors 
where is the limit? There is no limit, right? How fast you can capture the image, right? And how would it help in your data, right? When you talk in terms of the energy sensing, right? So sensors which can capture the energy or we can generate the energy and then transfer it from one form to another. There are many things which can be done in future, right? And as a civil engineer, there are plenty of opportunities when you look at, right, your geological science, right? Not only geological science, but you, I want that, can earthquake be, right? Yesterday also you must have heard, right, earthquake, right? Can it be done, right? Can we detect, right? How the earth shakes, right? At what frequency it will happen, right? And if we have those kind of information on besting, can it be done through this kind of, right, SCR technology? I don't know, because you are the expert in that area, right? So how we can capture these kind of sensors and how fast we can, right, take the actions so that the data which we can capture, right, are helpful to our society. So friends, I will not go in depth on this, right, because the, the commissioner will speak more, but the topic is of relevance, right, and uh, I'm happy that, uh, right, we are remembering Dr. Uh, uh, Garde also on this occasion and uh, celebrating our 175 years of right success and look forward right what we have done in the past in right in 175 years the history of IIT Rulki you have achieved a great but with your support right students right research scholars right young faculty members who are our star works for the future right let us look forward how fast we can develop right new technology for the society and come forward right with a good name for IIT Rulki. So with all these right I wish you all the best right and congratulate the entire community of uh, civil department of, right here at IIT Rulki and right for organizing such an event. Thank you very much. Thank you sir for your kind words. It's indeed a pleasure for me to introduce the audience about the eminent speaker, Dr. Tapan Mishra, although he doesn't require any introduction. If you make a Google search, you will find the full of pages, his achievements are there. In brief, Dr. Tapan Mishra has been the director of Space Application Center and Physical Research Laboratory, ISRO. He later became senior advisor to the chairman ISRO. At present, he is leading a startup company called SISIR, S I S I R, Radar Private Limited, based in Kolkata. Specializing in developing and maintaining the SAR systems and other variety of ground radars. We had qualified the IIT joint entrance examination with All India rank 85 in 1980. It's a big achievement and he secured the first rank in entire West Bengal. But to our surprise, he preferred to join Jadavpur University as electronics, a B.Tech electronics. So he graduated from Jadavpur University in the year 1984. He started his career as a digital hardware engineer involved in microwave remote sensing, payloads in SAC, SET and DAW. He is widely known for the design and development of c -band, synthetic aperture radar of Reset 1. He steered the development of Reset 2 series of high resolution X band SAR system. He led the development of high resolution C band airborne DM, SAR airborne LNS band SAR, and highly maintained X band SAR for airborne and UAV applications. Dr. Mishra was also associated with the development of the multi frequency scanning microwave radiometer instrument of portion set 1 and scanning spectrometer of portion set 2. Those who are working or involved in remote sensing activity, they know how important all these sensors are. He conceptualized and led the development of highly maintained dual frequency 
एस बैन सार फॉर चंद्रयान टू ऑर्बिटर विच वॉज ए वेरी सक्सेसफुल मिशन डॉक्टर मिश्रा रिसीव विक्रम साराभाई रिसर्च अवार्ड in 2004 and isro merit award in 2008 for his contribution in the development of this art technology we are really proud today that we have such an eminent personality with us and i will not now delay and request now dr tapan mishra to directly interact with the audience thank you dr tapan mishra आप यही से बोल सकते हैं इसमें ठीक है आपको ये ये माइक भी यूज करना है आपका माइक भी चलेगा ये और ये बड़ी भी है ठीक है सर तो आप ये तो पूछ सकते हैं ये फॉरवर्ड है और ये बैक है सर डायरेक्टर आईडी रुड़की प्रवीण कुमार जी एनसीओडी सभी दिन डिपार्टमेंट डॉक्टर संजय घोष डॉक्टर प्रदीप दर एंड ऑल एस्टीम्ड फैकल्टी मेंबर्स प्रेजेंट हियर एंड स्टूडेंट्स एंड डोर वर्चुअलिंग लाइव ऑन यूट्यूब and let me pay my homes professor achit gadi professor of delivery now you know the day many of you have to see the photographs you know these optical photographs you can very readily very readily interpret it and it shows innate intelligence and your emotional intelligence or your experiences can relate to interpreted photographic images but imagine that they were given an x-ray image it takes a specialized people to take such images it takes a, almost a 3 years md course to understand such images and interpret it and those who give consultancy on those interpretation the doctors with a radiology specialist they also take a good amount of fees from you you know the treat, synthetic aperture radar is like this extra images it shows you entirely different characteristics of your image and they what you do not see through eyes that they can you can interpret it so please yeah. going to interpret it and then that is where that is synthetic aperture radar is important is there you know this is surprising you know this is a technology which was discovered almost 70 years back and the, this technology was discovered by Carl Willey of Goodyear Aircraft Corporation and the, this and he was by profession actually a mathematician many of the engineering people today take pride like as in with synthetic aperture radar but discovered by a mathematician he was working on the missile technology and the subject you know it's an antenna subject surprisingly it was not understood much by antenna people so the electronics engineers rejected it in fact it is not much discussed by the antenna people and not taught under the antenna and it was developed specifically by optical engineers this technology and also this really the technology flourished when the signal processing become a subject and people started understanding and you know its application is being done by the civil engineers agriculture specialists geodesy 
the military people. And you know, this is very, very diverse. You look at the subject, the from its evolution to its application, it has a enormous applications, but it is still evolving. I must say it is still an evolving subject. It is not yet dead that uh, this is the end of SAR. And you know, this is, uh, the first SAR satellite actually flown in 1964. It flew for only four days. It has an image uh, they call the Quill P40. It was a very much classified, and I came to know its existence when it was declassified very recently. Even I was not knowing from my 70, 37 years experience. And the first military operational SAR came the CSAT. In fact, it is throughout. It is an Elban SAR, and throughout excellent images. And surprisingly, after th three months. That um, it was taken out, to telling that uh, this uh, there was a power supply failure and all those things. But uh, there were also different opinions because of the American intelligence community was a suspect it can pick up uh, this uh, under ocean movements of submarines very precisely. And you know, that's it. the predecessor of this SAR is an actually side looking airborne radar, and those who do not know. It is actually was developed by the Lincoln Laboratory of MIT, and uh, and in fact, you know, the first nuclear bombing of Hiroshima Nagasaki was done by using a side-looking airborne radar because it was a so much smoke-filled industrial cities, no optical camera could see through it, so they used. Uh, First side looking airborne radar for nuclear bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In fact, uh, you know, when I joined in 1984, you know, the, I was not smart enough. So, you know, they say all smart people from IITs and the MTECs, VTECs, and all, you know, they were given about clean jobs, you know, with the good buildings, you know, the, the IRS satellites and the communication engineering. And uh, I was put in a team with a broken Marconi radar donated by the, it was a not, un, not functioning. It was donated by Navy to ISRO and nobody knew what to do. So the small team was given a charge, what to do with it. And we converted it to a, a Imaging radar, side looking imaging radar flying on a Dakota DC 3 aircraft, very rickety aircraft, but a very stable one. And, then, and I learned something which I could not have learned in any other way had I been given on those promising projects. You know, I, I think that ISRO did a great service today to me by giving me a broken radar to repair and make it uh, functional. And I think that is a great training for younger people. They start with a disadvantage instead of starting with an advantage. Just to take the principle, it uses an antenna pattern, you know, it's a white, on the, it looks at the side of it. And the typical antenna is a rectangular antenna, and it is flown in the aircraft. And you see, it transmits a pulse. And as it returns, you know, you see the very nicely. As it looks at further and further, the resolution becomes wider and wider. And when it and at the cross range resolution, it becomes sharper and sharper. It's unlike the cameras. Cameras further you look, it becomes blur. But it is radar. If it looks further, it becomes sharper. That is the. But the problem is that its resolution on the flight direction gets degraded. You know, it is degraded. You know, it is, I will show you in images. You will realize. So, further you see, it's a degraded it's of the beams of an antenna, and multiplied by that the range it gives you the resolution. And you know, from a two kilometer orbit with a one meter to two meter antenna, the resolution becomes a two, two kilometer height, it becomes almost like 250 meters to 300 meters of that. And 
And if you fly a thermal uh, spacecraft, because obviously you cannot carry big antennas in the spacecraft, what you see that the, the resolution will be poorer by kilometers resolution. I'll show you the what how it looks like. And they, we actually built, you know, we are very ecstatic that they we could build them one and images and you know they it's like our own channel, you know. Also looks different and all, but we always loved loved our channel. So we used to and I used to be very proud of our development. And when I used to take to the bosses and all, you know, they say from two kilometer height, we're having a 500 meter resolution at a five kilometer away. And look, the tower we have thrown IRS one way and 830 kilometer, and we have a 36 meter resolution. This sharp images, you know, people used to talk to me in pins, you know, what is there? You see. And in fact, Progress towards building the center. I'll tell you that story, but before that, I'll tell you, you know, they say whether it's an antenna or a lens or a reflector or anything, its aperture is determined, its resolution is determined by its wavelength and size. You know, they say sports camera, they see a you see, they have to use a bigger lens for a sharper image. Those who want to, and you'll see. That they, the ratio is in lambda by A. In optical, the lambda or the wavelength is of the order of 400 to 700 nanometer. And if I fly from 800 kilometer, I need an actual an aperture of the order of 0.7 to 0.8 meter to get a 1 meter resolution. But just this lambda, you make it a few centimeters. You know, in L band, it is around 25 centimeter. In C band, it's around 6 centimeter. And X band, it is a, a three centimeter, and you will see that the aperture suddenly needed is a few kilometers. In C band, you know, if I have to get a one kilometer resolution, I have to carry a twenty one kilometer antenna. But the, for the same, the camera will be the very small one or 0.6 meter dia will suffice. And obviously, we cannot carry. And the synthetic aperture technology. Is to bypass this physical impossibility, and it is not the synthetic. In fact, it is being used, you know, from radio telescopes. It's a previous, and they said it is used for the tracking of Voyager, you know, going through millions of kilometers. Or the present discoveries of Event Horizon Telescope. It is also based on the synthetic aperture principle, and they. And all those antenna people, you should know that when you radiate, there is a small distance. We call it a reactive NF, non near field. We do not transfer power. Then, but there is a position, you know, you have a spherical wave front, you know, and then it becomes a parallel wave front beyond the 2D square by lambda distance. It's for electron synthesis. And we can see that the wave from the, the maximal power delivered when it is becomes the parallel wave from. And uh, we like to just uh, from that uh, uh, a fundamental principle exactly how it operates. We transmit a pulse and the returns are coming. And for a from target when you, if I store it in memory, you can see they're placed at a different distances. And it has to be actually stored in a memory, is stored there. And you know, if I can, you know, there is a possible if you look at it, they are in a different distances, and if I do a correction. Of that the total phase difference, I can actually form a mathematically a spherical antenna and then focus them and make a very narrow beam with it. Something okay, the escape button is not there. Keyboard is there. Escape button is not there. Yes, 
that's what it is in my head. I just take the principle, you know, it's, it's like a one target at the principle. I transmit wavelengths of equal phases, you know, that they're sinusoidally at a different time. They look, when they reach to the place, the distance is different, the phase is, becomes different, and they are in a different. If I put them in a straight line and then correct their phases, I can align them and sum them up, the signal builds up. And Obviously, what to do that is uh, from a linear path, whatever images we convert to a spherical antenna and then sum them up and the noises get incorrectly summed and you will see the signal can build up from the noise, which builds up and they... will see that the exact mechanization, how it happens, because this is what is the understanding point of view. We'll look at the three targets. You see the three pens are there. They say one is that the memory range and azimuth pen, and one in that the Doppler, because as it approaches, its Doppler is increasing. As it receives away from the target, the Doppler is receding. And what you see that is, if the, see the problem is to put these targets in a line and do a phase corrections make them a spherical antenna and sum them up and then the strong energy should come up. This is the fundamental problem. The problem is a, you know, you see there's a Doppler wise, it is almost like a linear, but in, in a memory plane, they are in a, some curves which are, you know, separated curves, their position. You know, I have to sum them, come back to the one range gate. If I try to correct in one of them, then they will become, you will disturb the other one. So what happens, you know, it took almost 10 and, I would say it's around 1984, 80s, the first time on a Stanford PhD thesis by Roca, he was then actually was working on a geophysical problems. He, from a sonar, his research was on the sonar. Uh, he was a from a subject of a geophysics, and they, he came out with this solve the problem. That's a, if you take a partial Fourier transform, you know this all which are non-overlapping trajectories in the memory plane, they actually become a best aligned in frequency domain. It's a very surprising because they all the time mathematicians told. If you have to take a, any n dimension data to take an FFT, first Fourier transform, you have to take all the data FFT. What you do, you do partially FFT in one set, provided there is a condition that the bandwidth ratios of both sides should be different. Very one side has to be small bandwidth, which is beautiful. And you know, it solves the problem that if you straighten in frequency domain, it's equivalent to straightening all the curves of the same range gate. And then you pass through a type of match filter because this phase correction is a match filter and they get aligned. And then this process, you can see those who are that a target, you know, it's a moving process, match filter. And you see this one by one data gets processed. But this is the fundamentally how it is done. This process, you know, they say we have explained it, you know, but say the signal will have a characteristic of a quality and they, it is passed through a type of delay line which gives exactly the opposite delay so that they, all the signal gets collided at one point. This is the signal processing interpretation, not the antenna interpretation. And this, this gets processed very nicely in a sharp image. I'll give you an example. This is a we simulated for the RI, RI chat data is in the length is in this direction almost at 21 kilometers. When you process the data through all the processes, it gets focused to a pixel of a one meter. It's in fact, it is a 0.8 meter. It's like, you know, terms, trying to locate a data in a haystack, a pin in a haystack, it is like this problem. And I'll show you that when you collect the data, it's 
actually looks at totally like a zero mean Gaussian thermal noise. In fact, if you plot it as histogram, it will be Gaussian noise only. There is nothing else you can see there. And when you process it, you get such sharp images. And this tech, you know, there's a many times all your images artifacts or the interface depends upon knowledge of how it is processed. If you are not having that idea of how it is processed, you will not detect, you will start thinking the artifacts as a, a feature. There can be many artifacts in the image if the processing is done wrongly. In fact, many times people get confused. The application people, they say, they think these artifacts are the features. So you should be able to distinguish these artifacts from the features. And we we'll look at this technology. Just this is a small slide. You know, they say before we had a lot of technology development, we had actually passive antenna and high power amplifiers. This was the technologies. And we have a fixed beam. If you look at the CSAT, ERS1, you look at the fixed beam. It is it subsequently, you know, there's a phase direct antenna came. Then the antenna could be steered on the direction of uh, on the cross track direction, and then the new imaging mechanisms came. And then subsequently, there came the MMIC technology. You know, one of the artists at its best, which is called the active array antenna. And this also had a, this feature. And the feature, it has come, you know, the both direction you can scan, but the digital beam format. You have a one transmitters and multiple receivers with a digitizer, and then you are able to scan along the flight direction. And you know, they say presently only the NISR is going with the they say what the Russians and NASA ISROSAR, of which I was one of the developer of the concept. So this is going with a digital beam format concept. And the, the synthetic aperture radar, what we are building under my startup, CC radar, it will have a innovative digital beam former radar, which will have a very high resolution imaging possibilities. Now, you know, this, you see that all the time, you know, we have drawn on a straight line, you know, took the FFTs and all. You know, whenever we do FFTs and all, you know, they have to be in an equal distance space and equal straight line. But the life is not that easy because, especially in airborne platforms, there is a many errors come because the aircraft, you know, never flies in a straight line. Especially the pilot is very shaky. He has a hand it always on a joystick. They do not believe in instrumentation. However, good instrumentation you give, the pilots, you know, they always believe on the joysticks on their own. Eyes. That is my experience. And you will see that it meanders around the straight line. So the two problems can come. That is, first, we have to bring the data as if they are in a straight line. It's a mathematically done, not exactly physically. We call it a motion compensation. And then we do phase correction and focus the data. Other things can be, you know, that's the velocity of that flight also can change. It can change, you know, which it can move, you know, that different time, there will be different velocity. You, you, one may ask, you know, how, how does it matter? They're quite stable. You know, what is stable for normal perspective? You actually, the velocity has to be stable with a 0.1 meter per second. It is 0.05 to 0.12. You, you imagine an aircraft flying at a, you know, almost a 500 kilometers, our speed has to be stable in a 0.1 meter per second, you know, just not possible. And what we do, we actually, that the velocity variations we measure, mathematically resample the data to get it as if they are in equal space. You know, then only the, my signal processing can work there. And then subsequently we focus it by your face correction and all. We look at a one, you know, almost an animation which actually shows you. You 
this is a almost a six dimensional motion should be there in the aircrafts. And you see, it images a particular track. And you know, this actual beam, when it sees, you know, there are inequally put. But when you look at a memory, the memory there are equal space, you know, it's very because they're taken at the equal time interval. And when you do a resample, you call it the PRF by B sampling, that's by velocity correction. So when you do along track velocity, you know, they are at time they get inequal, but in a spatially they are equal. And then subsequently we do the correction, you know, from we position, make it a, as if it is flying in a straight line. So you see the memory, it's a goes in a very meandering way that delta. And, and the whole process when you carry out as if it is a flown in a straight line, and can, in fact, we mathematically fool this processor. The data, as if the data has been collected in an ideal way, but it needs a onboard, you know, there was GPS aided INS today to make it possible to the sharp images, what I'll show it. And they, we have flown on the SAR system in 1992. I remember the date May 20 because that is the day the first ASL will also become successful. After one failure, they become successful. And we were the fifth country to build this radar and process it in the country. And I must tell you that say this SAR actually failed 52 times over a period of six months. And uh, we were, you know, many times we get a lot of degrees, but uh, we forget the basics. You know, that is the issue. And in fact, uh, uh, the team was responsible for the uh, SAR flying. And uh, that uh, they were, you know, the, the SAR will work very nicely on ground. And you take off a uh, uh, 28,000 kilometer you switch on, the SAR will burn off. And we're not knowing exactly what we'd repair and all and do. And uh, then finally, task came to me, you go, what I did, you did a slightly different. We did a, we asked the pilot to fly opposite to the air traffic controller radar direction and switch on the radar from the ground. We took a risk of burning, but we did not burn. And then flew the opposite direction of the ground radar. And we were surprised the SAR was working and when it reached at 10,000 feet, it suddenly stopped working. And then we understood that at 10,000 feet, the pressure, the internal pressure of the pressurized aircraft is maintained at a, a 10, 000, effective pressure of 10,000 feet. That is a 0.7 atmosphere. And you know, it was the corona discharge which was passing huge currents, the, the waveguide, which was passing huge currents to the electronics and burning of the electronics and chips. And we took the appropriate pressurization where all those, where actual potting we did and this. And you know, we have all learned at a class 10 level that all this corona discharge. And they, it took six months. And I, I must say that they, when I say it is a very looks trivial to you, you know, you look at the ISRO engineers and police. But actually, many times when we are focused too much on our subject, and we tend to forget many other aspects, and we do know we, we do not draw an inspiration from others, and that is where the whole problem comes. Oh. And you can see that they. And you know, it took 10 years for us to perfect the motion compensation. It took us four years to build the SAR radar. And you know, we fly, in fact, I used to fly most of the time. And you know, we used to go, we used to pray. You know, first to pray to Hanumanji, Camp Hanuman, then Coconut. And after all this, we used to pray today, it should fly in a very straight line and no atmospheric disturbance, no banking, no squinting, and any other thing. And, then, and out of 10 sorties, one sortie used to get the remains. And we became a really laughing stock, I must say. But then we built around 2002, perfected that SAR processor. In fact, today I can claim 
it is one of the best star processor in the world which can generate images under any atmospheric condition under any pilot at any time and you see this is a very classic images we got it multipolarization in fact we flew another star you know i tell you that uh, thing you know, we are making the ri set to so that hardware you know so part of the hardware we wanted to fly in aircraft and you know that was a resolution of 6 meter but the ri set was designed for a 0.8 meter and uh, what we thought you know we are just 6 meters we have flown what is that the same star processor will work but uh, let me tell you it took one month to understand a fallacy of first fourier transform to say that it that it how to perfect the process you know what you used to find is to process if a range resolution becomes very sharp azimuth resolution is to blot up or the azimuth is to become very sharp the range resolution is to blot up and you know for almost a month we are not able to know and uh, i am not discussing with the time and we'll see that if i discuss you, it is a so triviality of first fourier transform some specific properties and uh, that we ignore and that was causing the problem and when we generated we had a very one of the sharpest images you can see that you see the aircraft engines tails pins everything and you can see the small trees the separation and you can see very carefully you can see the two crops of different types of shadow looks different you can identify which crop is of what height and this different it is not an interferometric but the shallow angle through shadow properties you can see that and they, this was the one you know where, where we had tasked you know in 2008 there was a cosi bridge you, you know that uh, it was a very infamous bridge in nepal that time that the government by the prachanda was there and they, it was a raining heavily and uh, you know the lalu prasad wife rabri devi's constituency madhepura got totally flooded and they, and they, there was a that no other camera was being allowed by the nepal government to go there because and the indian mha has a many different understanding and suspicions what happened and all this thing and they, I, i don't want to get into conclusion but we flew over bihar image 100 km away, away and what you see this image is actually collage of approximately 60 images small small patches of images that flew one after another parallel lines and you can see that how seamlessly it got integrated they are actually got registered in a such a fraction of a pixel and you can see this uh, images there is absolutely no variation it shows you the power of sar in terms of radiometric correction and local location accuracy and we could identify what was the cause and all and you can see that the type of gradations uh, water flow into the bihar that happened you know this is one you know we i just happen to tell that uh, the resolution of a sar is surprisingly half of antenna length if i fly a 6 meter antenna i'll get a 3 meter resolution if i get a 1 meter antenna i'll get a 0.5 meter resolution if i get a fly a 0.2 meter antenna i'll get a 0.1 meter resolution that is a sharp principle data it says antenna length by and it is independent of the range whether i fly it 8 kilometer or 800 kilometer it is the same resolution you get it is sar properties that that it doesn't change that is the power of sar that it doesn't change you know I, and this what happened is that uh, but uh, you know but there is a signal to noise ratio consideration you know if i use a small antenna i have to pump more power which i cannot carry in aircraft or express craft and so we have to come to a compromise i have a reasonable length of antenna on which i need a reasonable amount of power which can be provided and we get this imaging done but but then you know we need a you know that a ri set was a 6 meter long so resolution best can be with a 3 meter 
But uh, with three meter resolution, if I want, but uh, there is some requirements from the government to have a 0.6 meter resolution. We use the spotlight mode. I will take that one. What it does, it goes on staring to that. I'm not going to the mathematical part of it, so we'll cut it there. But just to show it principle, go on staring to one point. And then we observe what we see that instead of a continuous imaging, we have a discrete imaging there. But we form a synthetic array length much longer than what dictated by the typical SAR normal. We call it a strip map SAR mode. And they, but it, it calls for tilting of the SAR. And we can do a synthetic aperture formation and make it sharper. In fact, that is what we have used. I have not gone to the rest of the processing thing, just quite involved on it because that is not warranted here. And you know, there is a, another condition, you know, that say, uh, suppose, you know, that say that's a from the pulse repetition frequency, you know, is determined. You know, if I have a small antenna, my pulse repetition frequency increases, then my swath reduces. That means I have to make it. You know, it's a antennas are very funny. In this case, R, you see, it should be a rectangular antenna. If I want to get a better resolution, my length I have to reduce, then my PRF increases, my actual uh, swath coverage reduces, and to accommodate such a thing, we have to increase that antenna in the cross direction. So to overcome that, uh, there, there is a cancer mode in which actually we get a much wider swath at the cost of resolution. You know, just it's an animation, not go through the principle, other principles. This whole synthetic and aperture is actually is divided into smaller, smaller parts, and the and the beam is electronically switched. It uh, the switching speed should be of the order of a few microseconds. And the, such things is possible, you know, when you have a phased array antenna or an active array antenna, that is what the RI said, you can have a much wider swath, but a coarser resolution. But the wider swath means, you know, that the global coverage becomes on a less number of cases. So that is what you know, we call it as cancer. And they, you will see that they, many of times when you encounter, you know, white swath, Coarser resolution SAR antenna, the cancer, you could get the what is the principle on which it works on it. And the images, you know, you look that uh, the cancer, you know, these are called, you know, that small image lights will have a gradation, so called the antenna pattern gradation, we call it a scalloping. And that needs to be corrected, and then only it can become a smooth, seamless imaging the mosaic possible. You know, they say many of you that the geodesy they use the interferometric shark. You know, interferometric shark is an, uh, another thing you know, which is uh, many of you know it. What is that? It's a from two antennas from slightly apart, we send a pulse. But uh, from when it reaches to another point, there is a slight difference between them. We can measure the difference between them and get back the uh, height of this target. And you know, the, as the height reduces, the phase difference reduces. As the height increases, the delays between them <coughs> increases, and we call it interferometry. I think that many of you they decide, you know, that there are many variants are there, distance scattering and all. We can show the amount of as we process with the ERS1, ERS2 tandem pass, how they look at it. And there is another variety, you know, that's the differential SAR interferometry. You can see that eh, this is done with the persistence uh, uh, scattering by a group in SAC and the Kharagpur IT. And we can measure that. Eh, uh, you know, how the subsistence of Calcutta is going, you, you can see that you say the subsistence is actually by almost an order of 28 millimeter per year. In fact, we visited this localities, we could see this a cracks in the building. We could look at the, those which have a, a basement parking slot, they are unaffected.
but the, those which are only isolated pillars and only joined by the beams uh, on the base, they were in relative displacements and the like, buildings, you know, there is a lot of cracks, you know, specifically they reflected as a diagonal cracks on the window corners and the joints and all. And they, this is all we have really observed that the subsistence what we predicted, the buildings are getting damaged. And they, surprisingly, those buildings, you know, some of the builders were very careful. They have went for a zone four, a zone five related classification design of the pillar spacing and all. And those buildings are having no issues. So, though it is not an earthquake prone zone, but for subsistence issues, there's an underground water depletion and the discharge and the recharge, there is a lot of. The, uh, gravimetric changes are happening and the subsistence occurring and though it is not a you know if i ask somebody ask me that they what sort of design you have to actually use a zone 5 earthquake related design now, those houses will have not have cracks in fact i have selected a flat while buying which is a zone 5 designs and that has no cracks now we built, you know, that's say, you know, RI set, you know, we flew it in the 2012, you know, it said that they, actually in 1999, actually ISRO was not embarking on a synthetic aperture radar because it was so costly. Let's say, if you buy from abroad, you know, Europe or USA, it cost something like a 1500 to 1700 course, the satellite together, it will cost 3500 that was what the ISRO's total budget we just so in 1999 I still remember that they I wrote a three piece proposal I went to director SAC the Gopalan was there that they, we can build a SAR here everything and they, he jumped up you are nobody you are a junior engineer young engineer you have no decision on quality that is what happens all big bosses tell, you know, the decision has to come always from top. It can never come from bottom and you must understand how the organization works and all he told. But after a plan, I, and he was quite, you know, he's no more there. He, he did a great service to Synthetic Aperture Radar. That man, he, and he was slightly hit by my last line. This would be built by the brown people in India. And you know, I was a slightly maverick type of handling. And uh, he, but then he sent it to Kasturi Rangan, a proposal. You know, though he jumped on me, sent it to Kasturi Rangan, that's a proposal. And uh, Rangan Saab made a committee to see this uh, development, what are, the, what are the costing and all. And as usual, you know, a big bosses have also big advisor. They told, you know, these people are not able to make a good airborne SAR images. How will they make space bone SAR? And I was a hardware guy, and the software people were different. And I actually, it actually hit me. If I have to make this proposal through, we have to make a SAR, airborne SAR working. And I am the person developed responsible as a part of the hardware team. And I was not knowing much of the software, it's a simulation of processor and all. And then I requested, you know, Aptesa from the, who was the head, heading CMC to donate a eight processor Xeon machine for six months. You know, nobody will say that in a hardware people have to buy a processor. And actually on this eight processor Xeon machine, we wrote a complete motion. In fact, this is all about patent, two patents it got. And we first then processed the SAR, every data was processed. It is no longer dependent on pilots and all. And, you know, that day we told that the Rangam Saab that they will show him these images. And we took him to Delhi. In those days, you know, that they, those image display softwares were not there. And the laptops have come new to SAR. And that there was a explorer. We can explore our only, we can display images. And we displayed images and all, you know, the tears started rolling down in. He asked for that file. And he asked, what is the initial money needed? We told, we have projected 23 cores for that developing that DVM system, digital verification model, that 
and he signed that paper and that is how in 1999 in november end the research project was approved and it's all to me to it was a all you know the same i had to change completely my subject from a microbe engineer to a signal processing and a multi processor algorithm writing and and it was a survival thing if i had not there you know that the sar would not have been there and we built you know we actually developed you know we actually you know co-opted getted to build that all mmics in fact we qualified that fab facility everybody was telling this is good for nothing but uh, we have co-opted and uh, this we built almost 11 industries in india which are today the mainstay of a backbone of space technology the privatization in the country that includes i, I can fondly remember the astra centum and many other companies which they developed out of this in fact they were all those days startup they nobody knew the startup actually and they, they built this well, today if you see that the uh, who's who of that uh, space technology delivery they, these are the companies which had in them and we built is all mmics this processor in fact its onboard system had a 314 computers it had a 1500 subsystem of that the 576 were the active and they, there were 6000 connectors there was a total digital cable length was more than 30 km and in its lifetime not a single tr model have failed it is like a 576 transponders of insect fly it was that capability was there and they were proud to build it and it's a it went to many many new technologies you know it's uh, when i look back in 1999 you know it was a very very audacious approach you know somebody asking to build a better than the best and today it is the standard and we have made a new you know, we have first time we introduced the hybrid polarimetry and today it has become de facto standard of all sorts and in fact i went to, to for a advisory role for the radar set following mission the rcm and it will be pick up that rcm parameters you see it's a deceptively similar to ri set is functional and all other parameters and we have first time in the c band did the spotlight and that to a spotlight of the order of 10 km by 100 km and uh, you can see that those times one of the best spotlights are was in the ri set 2 it had only 5 km by 5 km i have shown that image in fact uh, the first days imaging you know we scheduled it from my school you know from childhood school in the order ramkrishna mission to narendrapur ramkrishna mission was studied at 11th and 12th so that is what we mapped kolkata because, because i grew up there so i know all the spaces and we are the first time we have given the hybrid polarimetry in the cancer mode that is it before ri said nobody gave this one and we built a subsequently ri said to be their operational there is for many other military and other intelligence activities and many other actions it has a better than 1 meter resolution in x band you know it's a but then apart from our contribution because we had already matured we built it and all i will tell you that many times the cross intelligence is a very much needed expertise and we do not respect the cross expertise i you know that the electronics in, engineers are quite autistic you know i must say i am an electronics engineer or, or i say the engineers so there is a called a butler matrix for switching you know everybody 8 by 8 butler matrix it is written in a, everybody draws a drawing straight the face system. so they made a web guide and all it is a, a piece it is a huge one which cannot be accommodated in the satellite I have been requesting, you know, why don't you make it a 3D and all making? They say, "Sir, sir, no, that way, that way, that way, that way." And they, 
when the water period that the one nirmay university architecture students girl you know she is a third year she was uh, was an intern she was leaving and she came to do a pranam to me and then in the process we said why don't we extend seven days and i did you this this job you know this is the architecture hardware you have to convert to 3d and can you surprising you know this third year girl of an architecture student of nirma university she gave this a today this a flying it is one of the most compact partner mortis plan and the architecture people use a different type of software for visualization of geometry civil so those only used for such designs it made a difference and you know this surprisingly you know with the same the many many innovations can come by the cross fertilization of ideas of the branches but unfortunately we grow up in the so cross set you know we don't want to look into this these are the there is there are lot of classified images so i have shown from malaysia i have been showing from india we have built also small sars which is flying in an aircraft expand sir you can see the very sharp images uh, you know you can see the you know that the nano factory there was a piling up of nano unsold nano we knew it was getting to the close point and we have got an ln s band dual band sir you can look at this in how sharp images uh, it is now flying in nasa that drone system it is uh, as a part of a nasa mission and i am very proud of this you know the same chandrayaan 2 dual frequency sat you know the say in chandrayaan 1 that uh, john hopkins university they gave the s band sat you know that they, though i had also proposed but everybody told you know because it has to be international collaboration and all was the decision so that the nasa is fine we have been part of it but now that when the chandrayaan 2 came so what is the normal tradition we should repeat the same we should not experiment with a new thing isn't it i know that the ur rock committee was there and the jp jp uh, the nasa in chandrayaan 1 sir it was 11.5 kg and uh, you know the set to ward me off you are now sir no he was is everybody you know sometimes the management puts a constraint it keeps a innovation you know he told no no you have to make it polarimet i agree he said then you have to make it a dual frequency l and s band so that the differential penetration from the water dirty water estimate will be better i agree then you know he says 15 years you know and I even agreed that. And now, you know, in no place I stopped it. I did not claim the day because I was so keen to grab this project for ISRO. I was thinking that the why should go to other countries, NASA and all. They don't. No. Came back. My team members that time I was the deputy director of the remote micro remote sensing. My team members were almost going to lynch me. The previous sale built a 950 kg RI sat. From that day we are going to send the Chandrayaan 15 kg. And today I'll tell you it's a dual frequency L and S band, full polarimetric, and it has a four times harder than NASA did. And we finally flew 16.5 kg. And it was an I give a credit to my colleagues, you know, who went up and down. We are even counting grams, you know, to make it because otherwise they would be thrown out from the program. It kind of fly in Chandigarh, and then you know, there's a big lion is waiting outside the door. So we had to survive in that case. But today it is flying, and it is giving excellent images. you can see that the number of images we have taken that crater and all the that type of resolution it has a resolution of 2 meter resolution and those who are in a chandrayaan 2 sar project they can they must be having all the access of data 
And the next is a, you know, what is a very ambitious, it is actually that day we are testing the SAC. I'll tell you that the uh, RIS had to flew and they, I'll tell you the story later how the NISR came. And they, it was a great experiment because the Chandrayaan 2 made the L and S band SAC and the NASA came for a one SAR to fly for based on our RIS experience. And uh, we converted to two, but uh, it has to be it is entirely different. It's a fully interferometric star. It is such that every 10 days, you will have the images of whole global landmass and India's landmass with a, a change in the height denoted with a two millimeter echo in both L and S band. So it will have a different penetration and uh, uh, if for some reason it was getting slightly delayed. Uh, it was but to be launched in 2020, but the two days date it is 2023. But uh, once it is, it will have a enormous application for flood mapping, Arctic glacier studies, and they, uh, you know, earthquake uh, cautioning. You know, we cannot predict exactly when, but the earthquake is going to happen. The land deformation is coming, or a volcano is going to erupt. We can predict, though it may not predict that, but at least we can ensure we are not making investment in those regions. I'm not And they presently, you know, we are building. I understood that the application of SAR is most hindered the cost. In fact, those who are using the SAR data, they cost less, whereas the optical data cost few hundreds. That's a big difference because the SAR systems are costly, processing is costly, the data is costly. The only way if you want to make it applicable for common masses, especially I feel that for crop insurance, it is the, one of the best problems, so we built a startup and we took it a very innovative, we will bring down the cost by a factor of 10 from the market. And they, in fact, we are approaching to this part and it will be the India's or uh, the world's probably the second drone bonsa, but India's first drone bonsa and there is no competitor outside and they and they, for the India startup, we are actually quite well funded in seed funding. And they will also, this are what we're building it up, is an actually a developmental model of a space bond SAR. We are going to build a space bond SAR of a probably of a 150 kg class in another three to four years time frame which will uh, obfuscate the limitation of the spotlight side, that if you want to have a high resolution, it is to be spots. But it will have a first digital beamformer serve based on my patent, you know, it will have a continuous high, high resolution images. So we hope that uh, I'll get a VC funding and this, you know, those trying to build this SAR. We'll go to the SAR image properties, you know, that's it. To the tell how good the surface is reflected. You know, mirror is a very good reflector in optical, but the wall is not a good reflector. It is a catch factor because the roughness is of the order of wavelength of the optical. But it's a very good reflector of a sound wave or a microwave because the roughness is much smoother in fact than a wavelength. But there is a wavelength material. What should be the surface roughness? That's a approximately lambda by eight of that order. And then the, sur the surface is a reflecting surface. And this behavior, the, if the surface is very rough, if the signal is always reflected other direction, it is by the laws of reflection, all of us have studied in class seven, eight, and all of that. And then, but if it is a rough, uh, signals will be, some signals will be scattered back to the red eye. We call it a backscattering. If the signal is very rough, 
they are much more signal would be passed and they very less signal would be the reflected the as per the laws of reflection and that is why the radar process and properties you know varies with the uplink in fact by measuring the brightness of the image what we know from that is basically get a feature of surface roughness i'll just show you that's a two images the two c images in andama on two different dates one day it was a very windy rough you see the roughness on the left side one day it was a very calm the surface became different Similarly, you know, the same uh, the polarimetry signatures. You know, the, the RIS had first time showed the polarimetry signatures at different incidence angles, and you can see that the signature varies with an incidence angle because the reflectivity and the polarizing properties changes, and those also can be mapped. And you know, that way. Uh, we told the surface roughness is a function of frequency. So that's the one you know, which is a very good scatterer for in X band, but a very smooth surface for L band. It can happen. And they, this phenomenon is shown, you know, that when you have the X band images, they go to the crop canopies. And the C band images, they go slightly deeper to the crop canopy, except the signature of the stem structures. L band goes almost to the surface, so it picks up that not only the surface signature, but the overall structural signature of the plants. And in fact, I have been telling that say those who sell X band start to our military, these are they operate in a desert region, and because of this desert region, the X band is very nice. You can detect but in India. Uh, our tropical climate or the American climate, it's been is a useless system. But you know, but uh, because you know, whatever other people say, you know, if I advise today, people say, what is there? You know, there are so many people who have buildings are for last 30 years. They are telling it's bad, but they have bought X band and all. And I know most of them have become unsuccessful emerging. We couldn't get much of the intelligence and data on it. And uh, I was very happy that they. Uh, the recent IDX challenge opened by Prime Minister at the DEF Expo. In fact, many of my suggestions have come there. I say now there are challenges to build expand SAR for military reconnaissance of purpose and all. So there is a change in this attitude over there. And I'll just give you how this behavior. This is from Gela, from my friend Joe Morera, Alberto Morera. See, there's a P band SAR. It goes almost below the surface. You can see the signature. P band is a 460 to 560 megahertz. And L band picks up signature close to the surface, all the vegetation. And C band, you see that the surface information gets reduced. You have a comparatively more canopy variation. You see, this is how the frequency, multi frequency system, they get a different type of features. In fact, those are the features we must understand the frequency behavior to interpret the objects. Without understanding the frequency related behavior, you know, we may, okay, we have done with the research too, we have identified this is a one particular feature. So tomorrow I build an elephant, sir, this feature will look entirely different. We have to train our AI in a different way. You know, there is also so many of the crystallography physics you have learned that the back scattering. The periodic structure, they have a very strong scattering. If the periodicity is a related to almost nearby the lambda, they have the relations there. The, this signature is the same. So you will see the follow land, you know, they have a particular periodicity. Then, you know, that many of the construction, they will have a periodicity, structural periodicity. And they come out with a very stronger signature. I'll give you an example. You will see the bright line between RIS image. And then this bright line is a power line. You know, the power line, the each of the wires are very thin, but they are periodically spaced. They give a black scattering and a very strong retrax. So you know, you can identify. 
These are the regions it is a straight, then here it is got sag, again it is got straight. So this is the where the term getting the signatures will get it because of backstanding signatures. And then this is a very fine signature. You, know, you can see the pocket this one. It's a very velocity, the vertical polarization. When it will be the cross polarization, that the length is stop. The water is catch. There was a strong wind was blowing. The surface got a periodic roughness. That gave a black scattering of a very strong signature. So in four polarization, you got from the signature. But in cross polarization, the signature is, is missing. So you can, so many times, you know, uh, the polarization variability can bring out newer and newer features. And look at this plant map on an eight inch tesla. And first, it has got another signature that they, it has got a more uh, water extent it could pick up. And B, it got a lesser signature. So the, even the flood map, you can use a one polarization, it's a multiple polarization to get a real extent of water. Because when a flood happens, you know, the water is not only really very deep, there are actually very shallow water, the six inches water residing on the crop field, they give a different signature. So there is a lot of artifacts, you know, with the radar, you, know, you can see, there will be shadows, they call the radar shadow. You can see then a small object, but the radar is very inclined, it is a very long shadow. In fact, one can find out the height of this thing. And it says the Gandhi Nagar is the power plant with a cylindrical structure, so it doesn't splash scatter much. But you can look at its shadow. And you can from the shadow, you can identify where it is located and what is the height of the tower, cooling tower. So this is a quality information deep through the ID. Similarly, there's a radar level, let's say when you really terrain, the top layer is of the lower range, whereas the bottom is a far range. And you can see the as if the mountain has fallen, but the, with the images from both directions, you can actually correct it and make it a position at the precise location. This is a very classic case that is from Eros and Kayanis. Uh, you can see that the, the power pilot, the shadow in the right direction, but it is scattering because of the height difference, like a different range difference, it appears to have fallen. So while interpreting, you must have an idea of how would the target heights and what are other features to get the interpretation. And then you know, for the single frequency, the properties, you know, there's not a special property, you know, they say it becomes very noisy. I'm not going to explain it. But it today there are algorithms to make it a very clean up. This and we do that. This is the Sundar one. We are doing a study. We see that the other. I feel very bad that it has so much of Or it, you know, has been eaten up by the population as they have converted to crop fields. You know, yes. comparatively, Bangladesh has preserved the Sundarban better. And they, this is how, because the agriculture and forest area, you know, how it could be segregated. Yes, this is the multipolarization region. So the crop area and the forest area, because of polarization differences, they are getting segregated. Then they, you can have a look at the intelligence about the structure, the glass refinery. It's the Adani port and seeds. In fact, it's a very excellent tool for actually the identifying the seeds, boards in the environment. What is so great because the, today the intelligence on the boat movement is very crucial for our security, for also for the smuggling activities what is going on to prevent. And then they say, with the flood, you know, the automated software picks up the flood. 
very precisely on the whatever the water surface. Only the test, changing water bodies over the season is one of the major plan. You know, those who are doing the, working on water set research, they have a uh, they need to know the water volume present for you know planning for irrigation, which is a for government one of the major information. It's, and the, unfortunately, the time this water build up into this our rainy season, the no cameras can take an image. But this is radar can go through and take the images, and you can see that the, how the water layer bodies have enlarged over a month. And then this is what you know, because when the cyclone hits, you know, you, you see the cyclone cloud. You appear, you know, the cyclone cloud is filled over the whole region and it must be raining everywhere. It doesn't rain everywhere. It rains only in specific areas. So when we understand you know, how much the area got a rain pet due to cyclone, you can measure the soil moisture through that, it is through that, and you can find out these are the areas, the soil moisture area will come out as a bright in seabed, and you can find out these are the areas and it has actually rained. And they, this is the recent images, you know, the same equal war, those who are following, the lots of ups and downs. And I must tell you, the equal is a place, you know, which is covered by clouds. And they, initially, the Ukraine had a they have to militarily, they have to lose regions and all. But uh, subsequently, they have deployed the, through crowdsource, they deployed the SARS uh, radar. And, and they took the time. Now, no tank can hide behind bushes and the uh, cloud or the ice, the snow. The radar picks up very nicely. And they, and it turned the, you know, that's a whole Ukraine war in a, now in a, as if it, it, what was a one-sided game, today it has become, uh, nobody knows who the final winner will be there. And they, I must appreciate our former Prime Minister, Manmohan Singh, you know, taking keen interest in his time it came, and he was very keen that they, the few and first images came, you know, he invited us to have a just talking and he was he is a very you know, person of a very sharp intelligence and a very wide knowledge and I was very impressed by the way he could jack me up with us so many it was probing questions. And then I you know that they were in 2012 after the SAR launch, you know, they were to U.S. State Department for a negotiation, and uh, there it happened. You know, this NASA chief Charles Bolden, you know, he took me as he asked, "Did you bring the SAR at this cost?" I said, "Yes." He says, "I want to see this lab where this SAR is built at a such a cheap cost." In fact, three months later, he flew down to specifically to Ahmedabad, went to the lab. Had a look around, a spaced around. I just wanted to understand how we Indians could build a SAR at a, such a cheap price. And that led to that uh, nicer program today. Thank you for your patience. Questions. Well, very uh, informative, very nice lecture and updated uh, our knowledge. And we could understand more about the working of the SAR through especially those animated slides. He gave very good examples of how the, you know, people have started their startups. And to young mind, uh, these examples are actually uh, very useful because uh, we really do not know how many of you then uh, would like to develop the career in this particular area where there is a lot of potential. Uh, from the audience, if uh, there is uh, anybody would like to interact, any clarification, any doubt, if they are quickly. Uh, 
डेंजरस जो very low pressure zones so you have to take care of infected that they, today they are born sars they cost anywhere between 75 to 375 or 400 dollars and they the because that the aircraft has a lot of 6 degree of freedom there's a lot of flight dynamics so there needs a extensive motion compensation and the computation goes on so the processing is difficult the sars are the cheapest on a drone because it flies on a very low altitude where there is not much pressure difference you don't have to take a lot of corrections but the processing becomes very tough because it is a slow moving and it it cannot carry more it has to carry small antenna so it is a very wider aperture and there is a lot of motion disturbances So they have to be stopped. So the processing will be much more complicated. Say that the airborne sar processing is ten times complicated than a space bound sar, and drone sar processing, in my estimate, it will be hundred times more complicated than the space bound sar. Actually, the computation engines, you know, we have put up a array of parallel processors today, so because the sar will be cheaper, but the computation systems are. Computation speed will be a cost, but surprisingly, today multi-process systems are coming in a very cheap price. Through our impact, we you know we are a small company startup. We do not buy these branded ones. We buy the parts, these power supplies, and we get computing system at a one fifth of the cost. So initially, we used to think, you know, why it, but today we have now a custom. We build most of the hardware, except the measuring instruments, our cells, our facilities, so that you know by buying you know some of the cases we have bought most of the cases we have bought from Amazon, very cheap prices, and you, know, you can build the cost at a very very cheaper price today. That is an advantage today, and we want to build a SAR. Even the drone also we are building. When we are even contract one person, so he will take four lakhs rupees at the. Each one is animals. This drone, also if you buy components and all, then the drone cost comes down by also factor of five. And today that so it is possible. And if you use Raspberry Pis to buy the controller, all the cost comes down. And the Raspberry Pi today is a very very cheap. So what you you know for the what is being You know, being touted as a hobby in electronics, it is actually very powerful. We are using it. So these are the new technologies, which many times our professors and other people in ISRO they think you know the Raspberry Pi you know is a children player. Actually, what children nowadays use we should use today the recorder. You know what to buy a recorder. We a solid state recorder for the space or airborne. It will cost me lakhs. But uh, today I can buy a Samsung one terabyte. <laughs> it will function as good as the ten thousand rupees. So these are the ways we are doing. That's why we went for drone. And the drone, you know, if you lose it, it is cheaper. If you lose it, it doesn't pay you much. That is one of the advantages. Any any other? Uh, 
Yes, we correct it. You can map it. That was you can use the motion conference system to map the height details very precisely. Provided you achieve the, the problem of satellite data is that eh? satellite data they go by the prediction. They think the prediction is correct. Actually, I feel that if I build a satellite today, I'll put a navigation system today. Both INS as well as GPS. And that will give you more accurate spacing. And then we can predict this mathematically recompute this by projection. In fact, the, this drone cell will be used for the data for our trend. We'll use this exactly the same data by reprojecting the data of our to multiple passes and make it a very precise path. That we know that we are reforming the information that we can. Yeah. So if I motion compensation, we can make the heights exactly precise. We can make them the two heights very parallel by motion compensation. You can project it. Okay. Any other? All right. If uh, there is no question, then we end up this session. So please take the seat. So a big round of applause to the speaker. And we would like to thank uh, from the core of our heart the speaker. Very, uh, he has kindly agreed to come to the our campus and uh, deliver a very illuminating talk. And uh, in fact, uh, it has uh, indeed uh, improved our understanding of the synthetic aperture radar. We would also like to thank uh, the director of the institute, Professor Pant, for sparing his valuable time and gracing this occasion and giving the necessary approval. Thanks are also due to the head of the department, uh, who has always been supportive for such academic activities and uh, he is always positive uh, for such kind of expert lectures. We would thank Dora. Professor P.S. Roy, his office staff, particularly Mr. Vishal, for giving us all the uh, necessary help and support to organize this lecture. Uh, many, uh, uh, you know, the students uh, have helped us uh, in organizing this particular lecture behind the screen. So. Uh, all the students of GEG, they deserve a special thank, particularly Mr. Abhishek, Sahid, Himanshu, Him Pushpa, Pavan, and others. Most importantly, uh, the, the audience, uh, you know, whose presence has made this uh, program a success. So thanks are also due to them. Lastly, I would like to thank uh, Professor J.K. Ghosh, whose untiring efforts uh, has brought this day for us. And this was, uh, you know, he is very much instrumental in uh, bringing the experts to uh, our department, to our group, almost every Wednesday. So uh, we are enriching our knowledge with his great efforts. So thank you all. Thank you very much.